Uh, hi, uh, I'm John Slattery. I'm the Vice Dean for Research and Graduate Education for a couple more months uh, in, in the School of Medicine. Uh, great pleasure to welcome you uh, all here uh, today for Young Investigator Science and Medicine Award featuring Smita Jayadev. Uh, John Scott knows me very well. He was terrified that Mike might actually introduce Smita. He insisted that he would do a much better job, and so he's going to come up and do that now. Thank you. Thanks, John. When, when are you retiring, John? <laughs> so uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Smita. And it's also a great pleasure to be able to do it in front of an audience of people and also to be able to share with everybody that's online. So, you know, as we move forward, uh, let's hope that we can begin to spend more time together in scientific situations such as this. So um, it really is a great pleasure to be able to introduce Smita Yadav today, our, our young investigator, science and medicine pleasure. Smita um, hails from India and did her undergraduate work there and then moved to the University of Pittsburgh where she did some really elegant cell biological work. This propelled her to do postdocs in uh, UCSF with Yu Huan and Lily Jan, where she was really introduced to some of the sort of important molecular aspects of, of, of neurobiology and neural signaling. And this brought her to the point where she began to work on disease causing mutations in protein kinases that relate to autism spectrum disorders. And this is a really fascinating and really important area of research. It's very vibrant. And, and Smith has just done a fabulous job sort of pioneering some of this work. And she's gonna tell us about that in a few minutes. Before we get to that, I, I just also want to acknowledge the tremendous commitment that she's had to the Department of Pharmacology since she's come here. She's our faculty senator. She's spearheaded a lot of the uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion work, and has really just been a fabulous colleague. So it's really my pleasure and privilege to be able to introduce Smita and pass the podium on to her, Smita. Thank you, John, for the really nice, kind, and heartfelt uh, introduction. And um, I am really lucky to be in a really uh, supportive and um, um, generous department, as well as uh, university, for, for my work. Can you guys hear me well? OK, cool. Um, OK, so today I'm going to talk about some of the work that my lab has done over the past four years. Uh, trying to understand kinase signaling, uh, and specifically from a disease perspective, um, how aberrant kinase signaling um, is, a, is a major cause of neurodevelopmental disorders. So here what you're seeing is a human kinome dendrogram. And Kinases are really fascinating enzymes um, or proteins uh, that perform a fundamental catalytic uh, reaction that I'll talk about in the next slide. But here what I want to show you is that um, the, the sheer number and diversity of protein kinases. Each dot shown here in this dendrogram represents a kinase. And uh, uh, over 2% uh, of all human genes encode for protein kinases. Uh, this also depicts um, the diversity and also the structural homology between the different members of the human uh, kinases. So what are kinases? Kinases um, are proteins that uh, perform this fundamental uh, catalytic reaction of trans uh, um, uh, transporting a phosphate group from an ATP molecule and adding it with very high temporal and spatial specificity to um, to their substrates, uh, such as here in this, uh, shown in this enzyme. So you see a kinase molecule that, that utilizes, binds and utilizes ATP uh, to, to transfer the phosphate group onto its substrates. Now, importantly, this reaction is reversible. So you can take off this phosphate group and this reaction is mediated by another class of uh, proteins called protein phosphatases. So at any point in time, the phosphorylation state of a protein is dependent on the opposing activity of kinases and phosphatase uh, proteins. Um, this process of adding on a phosphate group is called phosphorylation. And so what is the outcome of, uh, of, of phosphorylation? 
it can have a very diverse downstream consequences. So phosphorylated protein could change its localization. It could change the intrinsic activity of the protein. It could cause its degradation or turnover, uh, change its conformation and binding partners, as well as induce uh, post-translational crosstalk by um, creating a site for other kind of post-translation modifications, such as ubiquitination or acetylation. This pioneering work of understanding the mechanism of uh, protein phosphorylation was led by two scientists here at University of Washington, um, Eddie Fisher and Ed Krebs, who in the mid 1950s did some amazing work to elucidate the basic mechanism of this reaction. For which, For which in 1992, 1992 they, they won, won the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. Um, and today we understand that protein phosphorylation regulates almost every single aspect of cellular function. In the context of brain development and neuronal development, uh, again, kinase signaling mediates almost every single aspect of neuronal development, from neurogenesis, where a neuron is formed, to its branching growth, um, arborization of its dendritic tree, uh, formation of dendritic spines that are, sp uh, that are sites at which synapses are formed, to its functional integration into uh, networks, uh, neuronal networks, are all mediated by very important kinase signaling pathways, some of which are listed um, uh, on the slide. So it's not surprising given uh, the, the function of these kinases in each step of neural development that uh, mutations in these kinase encoding genes uh, would be uh, uh, associated with neurological disorders. So mutations in kinases have been shown uh, to be causative in autism spectrum disorders, schizophrenia, uh, as well as Down syndrome. In addition, neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's have also been um, shown to be associated with kinase mutations. So yet, despite the very clear disease significance, our understanding of protein kinase signaling in neuronal development is really lacking. And so this slide depicts the number of publications on, um, on studies where kinases have been targeted in disease uh, seems to have skyrocketed since the discovery of imatinib or Gleevec um, uh, in, um, um, in, in curing um, uh, ABL-BCR-mediated uh, cancer. Uh, yet, the number of publications um, in CNS disease where kinases have been targeted, even in mid-2000s, uh, um, uh, is very, very low. And so why is this? Uh, the inherent complexity of the central nervous system, um, the blood-brain barrier, as well are really like lack of understanding of what kinases do uh, in neuronal disease uh, is a key cause of this, um, um, uh, this limitation. This slide highlights um, very few kinases that have been targeted uh, so far. Um, so about 20% or over 100 kinases um, have a protein structure have been looked at um, at the molecular and structural level, have uh, FDA approved uh, small molecules that target these kinases. But the majority of them, about 80% of these kinases, um, are understudied and they are termed as the dark kinome. And, and most of the CNS disease associated kinases fall in this dark kinome category. So, in order to advance our understanding, it is key that we characterize these unexplored kinase targets and understand how mutations in these kinases um, um, lead to uh, disease. Just to give you an example, on this kinome dendrogram, you're seeing all the kinases highlighted in red that are associated with autism spectrum disorder, and there are over 40 of those. Yet, excluding a few uh, kinases such as like A1, we know very little about the functional role of these kinases and how might their um, uh, aberrant kinase signaling mediated by these kinases can lead to disease. So my lab is focused on understanding three basic questions. Understanding the molecular function of kin uh, kinases associated with neurological disease, understanding how mutations in these kinases contribute to neurodevelopmental deficits, and understanding how does dysfunction in these kinases bring about change in brain function, and importantly, can these kinases be targeted um, uh, therapeutically? So today I'm going to tell you two stories um, about um, a really fascinating group of kinases called 1001 amino acid kinases. 
These are uh, highly conserved serine training kinases. So these kinases will phosphorylate the serine and training residues. Um, and in, in mammals, uh, this gene has been triplicated to form three paralogs, tau1, tau2, and tau3. Here are the three uh, kinases shown again, um, and you can see their two-dimensional protein structure. Uh, the largest of them is tau kinase 2, and uh, it's a very strong candidate for um, uh, an autism risk gene. Uh, structurally, if you look at that, it seems like tau K2 is the most divergent from, from either the Drosophila tau, the C. elegans tau, or the other two tau homologs. Um, and I first got interested in this kinase uh, during my postdoctoral work, where uh, we found that the kinase is, first of all, highly expressed in the brain. And here it's shown its expression, protein expression is shown in neurons. Um, also, if we express a kinase dead version, so a catalytic dead version of this kinase, we see a really robust uh, uh, defect in formation of dendritic spines. So dendritic spines are these mushroom-shaped protrusions that you're seeing on the dendritic membrane here that form the site of synapse formation for excitatory neurons. When we uh, express this kind as dead tau 2, we see a severe defect in the formation of these dendritic spines. Uh, instead, we see these visp wispy filopodial extensions that are really immature and, um, um, and uh, dynamic and unstable. As a consequence, there are a number of downstream synaptic deficits. This gene is also part of a really important um, region on the 16p arm of human chromosome that undergoes um, recombination uh, and deletion and duplication in disease conditions. So this region, either when it gets deleted or duplicated, leads to autism spectrum disorder and schizophrenia. And the mechanisms behind why and which genes are contributing to the defect is unknown. More directly, recently in 2019, mutations in tau2 were identified uh, uh, within the tau1 encoding gene. So our goal is to understand what is the molecular function of tau2, how does tau2 associated mutations contribute to def defects in neurons, and what is the mechanism behind uh, these, uh, these defects? So the first thing we wanted to do is understand what does this kinase do? And when we looked at it from a bioinformatic perspective, we found that there's a very unique hydrophobic region uh, at the C-terminal of this kinase. Uh, which is predicted uh, to form six transmembrane domains um, and an amphipathic helix. And this was really very surprising because for the past 20 years, it was uh, thought of in the literature that this was a cytoplasmic protein. So we developed an antibody uh, that would uniquely recognize this protein. We generated a, a fluorescently tagged protein, um, uh, tau2 protein, to be able to visualize where this protein localized. And to our surprise, we found that the protein rec um, localizes to an organelle within the cell called the endoplasmic reticulum. Here you're seeing the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum or the ER in red, and the cyan dots that you see are the localization of the tau2 protein. And here you can see a beautiful co-localization of tau2 uh, kinase on the ER membranes. Bioinformatically, again, we could show that tau2 indeed was in the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum along with other known uh, ER proteins. So what is the ER? The ER is the largest organelle in the cell. Um, it forms this beautiful lace-like structure um, that is important for, uh, is the site of protein synthesis and all lipid synthesis. Additionally, it is the cell's biggest calcium st uh, store. And for this beautiful morphology and for many aspects of its function, the ER is dependent on the underlying cytoskeleton here shown in green um, is the microtubule cytoskeleton. And this will be important later in the talk. So you can see that the ER membranes are highly connected to the cytoskeleton. They're extremely mobile and active. What we found is that when we overexpress the protein, the protein actually localizes really strongly to microtubules. And we did some domain deletion experiments to map which is the region within the protein that binds microtubules. And we found that the last 40 amino acids of the protein uh, can directly um, and specifically uh, bind, um, uh, bind to tubulin um, with very high affinity. So this led us to trying to understand what is the, what is the function of this protein? 
And at, around that time, AlphaFold, which is a uh, protein structure prediction software, came out. And we were really uh, surprised to see this very unique structure of this protein kinase, which um, actually matched really nice our cell biological data. So here you're seeing the six transmembrane domain of the uh, kinase that localize it to the ER membrane. The C-terminal um, cytoplasmic tail shown here in red um, is the region that binds microtubules. And then the kinase domain and these two uh, coiled coils um, are cytoplasmically lo localized. So based on this, we hypothesize that tau 2 is a unique kinase that tethers the ER membranes to microtubules. And we can use uh, an antibody against the endogenous protein to localize it exactly at the junction where the ER membranes uh, meet the microtubule uh, cytoskeleton. And here you can see in this movie, um, the really dynamic um, localization of tau 2 on the ER membrane at the exact same spots, uh, probably more obvious here in the three, uh, in the three channel merge. So this was, uh, this was really um, um, exciting for us, um, but we wanted to see if this was necessary. So to test that, we generated um, two knockout lines using CRISPR-Cas9, where we knocked out uh, the tau 2 protein to look at if the tethering between the ER and the microtubules was affected. And indeed, in the knockout cells, we found large regions of the cell where the ER was absent um, because it was not tethered to the microtubules anymore. The uh, interaction of the ER membrane with microtubules is indeed very complex. So there are molecules that tether it uh, directly to the, micro, to the microtubules. There are motor proteins that mediate um, uh, bidirectional movement of the ER on microtubules. And there's a specialized movement of uh, ER um, at the very plus growing tip of microtubules. So as expected, we found that there would be a change in tethering uh, of the ER to the microtubules. If we knock the protein down, we see very um, um, uh, we, we see a lack of tethering, and we see an increase in the overall motility of the ER. But surprisingly, we also saw a defect in the tap movement. So here you're seeing uh, the movement of ER tubules on the plus steps of microtubules shown in, in red. Um, and this is how a normal ER uh, would move on microtubule plus steps. But in the knockout condition, we lose the specific movement of ER um, at the plus steps, even though there are so many plus steps um, of microtubules growing around the cell. So another um, um, cellular process during which the ER is extensively remodeled is during mitosis. So here you're seeing a mitotic cell or a cell that is about to divide. And you can see that the ER is converged at these two spindle poles of the cell. What we found is that in the tau to knockout cells, um, the ER does not converge at the spindle poles anymore. And there's a uniform distribution of the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is, um, fits nicely with the fact that tau 2, in fact, localizes um, in mitotic cells to the spindle poles. Um, this lack of association with the spindle poles has uh, downstream consequences for cell division because in the knockout cells, we see an increase in the number of multipolar and misaligned spindles. Um, okay, so how is this process regulated? Um, tau 2 is a kinase, so the first hypothesis we had was that probably the kinase activity of tau 2 was important for its tethering function. Um, to test that, we generated a, um, a point mutant, uh, K57A, that lacks its catalytic activity. And surprisingly, we found that this um, kinase dead mutant is actually a better tether. So it appears that in, abs in presence of this uh, catalytically dead um, uh, uh, mutant, there's an increase in the overlap of ER and microtubules and the ER motility decreases. This indicates that the kinase activity is important for negatively regulating how much the ER is tethering uh, with microtubules. So while in interface cells, this does not appear to have a, a major role except in decreasing uh, ER motility, in mitotic cells, this has a profound defect. So here's again a wild type expressing uh, mitotic cells, and you can see the kinase at each of the spindle poles. You can see a beautiful ER morphology where the ER is concentrated at the spindle poles, but for the most part, the ER is absent from the metaphase plate. And this absence is actually important for the cells to divide. 
if we express the K57A mutant, we see that now the entire ER is collapsed onto the spindle here shown in blue, um, along with the localization of the kinase dead um, onto the ER. So this uh, um, uh, ability to not disengage from the mitotic spindle causes the chromosomes to be displaced and these cells will never divide. Um, and the defects in mitotic cells is, uh, is quantified here. So this work um, has been done by two very talented scientists in my lab, uh, Kimia, who's a graduate student, uh, very close to her defense, and Amy Pareccio, who's a postdoctoral uh, uh, fellow in my lab. Um, and their work together has shown that ER um, and microtubules um, are tethered together by this um, kinase that has direct binding affinity to both um, ER and microtubules. And importantly, uh, the phenotype of the kinase dead tau2 is the opposite of the phenotype of tau not out, which means that the kinase um, and dead um, tethers more strongly, um, has um, uh, loses the ability to, to disengage from the mitotic spindle, uh, whereas in the knockout, you see lack of ER tethering to microtubules. So why is this important for neuronal development? Um, it appears that microtubules and uh, ER tethering is important for ER uh, tubule extension. Um, for extension of uh, dendritic arbors, um, as well as for uh, synaptic plasticity. And so now we are interested in understanding how tau2 might contribute to uh, neuronal development. And for this, we have generated uh, an, a human-induced pluripotent stem cell line um, that is uh, lacking the tau2 gene. We have um, differentiated them to uh, create neural progenitor cells. And now we are in the process of differentiating them to try to understand um, how uh, tau2 might uh, contribute to neuronal development. Um, and this work is uh, being led by a surgeon who is a graduate student in the lab, who's trying to understand how the ER and tau2 motility uh, within the neurons using both stem cell and cultured neuron, neuronal models um, uh, affects neuronal uh, development. So coming back to the 16P disorder, um, this is a really complex disorder, um, both because uh, there are a number of genes that are affected. But what struck us uh, looking at the genes here that there are two protein kinases, tau2 and mapk 3 and then there is a protein phosphatase. And so any deletion or duplication of this region will have profound um, uh, consequences in the phosphoproteome of, of the neurons. Um, here are shown the uh, phenotypes of deletion and duplication. So both are associated with autism, intellectual disability. Um, um, there are so certain opposing changes, such as in the deletion, uh, patients have an association with macrocephaly or an increase in brain size, whereas in the duplication, there's an uh, association with microcephaly. So we wanted to take um, 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 a more human-based approach to try to uh, study these the disease. So the model system we chose uh, was uh, human iPSCs um, derived from skin cells from patients that have the deletion and duplication. And in some prior work, uh, what we had found is that um, the neurons that are derived from these patient stem cells um, can recapture some of the defects that are seen in patients. For example, uh, the deletion, um, patient-derived neurons are much larger, both in the dendritic arbor as well as the soma size. And the reverse uh, change in size is seen in the duplication patient uh, neurons. And then there are um, certain overlapping and opposing changes in, uh, in, in synaptic density. To better understand um, in an unbiased protein-wide um, um, basis, what are the changes that are uh, happening in these patients? We use these uh, patient cell lines of, from three deletion uh, patients, three duplication patients, and some unaffected individuals, and performed a, a quantitative phosphoproteomic labeling called tandem mass tab labeling. We enrich for phosphopeptides, and we then do a quantitative analysis of what is differing in the samples from these uh, different patients. And then there are two pathways that emerge. One is cilia and centrosome associated proteins, um, that were affected between uh, un that were affected in control and uh, disease patients, um, as well as metabolic growth pathways. And two, these two pathways are being followed up by uh, Amy, who's a postdoc in the lab, and uh, Sophia, who's an undergraduate researcher in my in my lab. 
So to summarize this, um, this part uh, of the talk, uh, I've shown you that we've identified the molecular function of tau2 as an ER microtubule tether. Um, we are currently analyzing uh, autism disease mutations in tau2, um, as well as uh, and, um, uh, following up on the two signaling deficits that we have identified in 16p11.2 uh, copy number variation. So the next kinase that I want to talk about is tau1. And um, evolutionary, it seems that tau1 is the closest to the Drosophila and the C. elegans um, at, the, at the structural and sequence level. Um, I want to point out that this is a very highly associ autism associated gene. In fact, it's got the highest score in its, uh, as being a risk gene for, for autism. Um, yet for the most part, the molecular function of this kinase remains unknown. Uh, there are two recent studies, one in 2019 and one in 2021, um, that have uh, shown that in patients uh, with autism and um, global developmental delays, a number of mutations have been found in this, uh, in this protein kinase, some of which are in the kinase domain, but also many that are not. Um, this gene also shows up as one of the uh, 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 49 genes that has a very strong association both with autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, tau2 is uh, very highly expressed in the brain. It's expressed uh, in almost all areas of the brain, but more specifically uh, um, in the hippocampus and the cortex, um, two areas of the brain that are important for um, uh, um, ASD pathology. Um, what we found was that if we express the kinase dead, tau1, we see um, a, a defect that's similar to the tau2 defect, but there are a few changes and dissimilarities. The first is that these uh, aberrant membrane protrusions seem to be everywhere in the neuron, including the soma, which we have never seen before. Um, and um, these, um, these extensions uh, can reach really long distances, um, um, which are greater than uh, 10 to 12 microns uh, in length. Also, it appears that it's it doesn't have to be a neuronal cell type. You can take any cell type and express the kinase dead tau1, and you will see these aberrant uh, membrane protrusions. The other thing to note here is that while the wild type kinase, for the most part, is cytoplasmic, um, there's a small population or a, a, a decent moderate po mod population of this kinase that localizes to the plasma membrane. So the kinase activity is important um, for keeping the protein cytoplasmic. And in all the kinase dead versions, the protein mislocalizes to the plasma membrane, which we hypothesize is inducing these filopodial extensions. Um, we have now characterized many of these disease-associated mutations. All the four mutants in the kinase domain are kinase dead. They all localize to the plasma membrane, and they all induce the filopodia extension. Some of them um, um, uh, are truncation mutants that are mislocalized and some of them uh, cause aggregates within the, within the cell. So using similar deletion, uh, domain deletion experiments, we wanted to identify what is the part of the protein that can localize to the plasma membrane and create these um, protrusions. We mapped it down to these three foil coil regions that is necessary and sufficient for localizing to the plasma membrane and also necessary and sufficient for inducing these very aberrant um, um, membrane protrusions. So it appears that in the normal scenario, the kinase domain is neg negatively regulating the coiled coil domains uh, to prevent um, uh, plasma membrane association. And in the absence of kinase activity, either in a point mutant or in a deletion, you get this aberrant membrane binding and, uh, and filopodial protrusions. So again, we used uh, modeling by AlphaFold uh, software to see what these coiled coils are doing. And they're forming this really um, um, uh, nice uh, three uh, helix uh, bundle. And there, this is very reminiscent of a number of other uh, membrane binding uh, proteins. To test whether um, these tri this triple helix can actually bind membranes, we do the lipid overlay assay where we uh, purify the protein and try to test which uh, kind of lipid does the protein bind. And we find that uh, the triple helix can directly bind PIPs, PIPs 2s, and PIP, PIP 3s. Um, also, if you look at the charge distribution uh, on, this, uh, uh, on the model of this protein structure, 
we see that there's a clear partition of negative charge shown in red and positive charge shown in blue. And since the plasma membrane is negatively charged due to the presence of phospholipids, we, we hypothesize that binding of this positive, positively charged surface to the plasma membrane is what is responsible for inducing membrane protrusions. So one of the most exciting experiments is that this is reversible. Um, we can take all of these mutants um, that bind the plasma membrane, induce philopodia, and then rescue them by just expressing uh, the kinase domain. So here in blue, you're showing, I'm showing you the helical bundle, uh, which is um, mostly at the plasma membrane. This is the fluorescent intensity of, of the protein localization, um, and very little in the cytoplasm. When we express this helical bundle along with the kinase domain, just the purified kinase domain, we see that this localization shifts back to being cytosolic. So this uh, leads up to avenues in which we can try to prevent these uh, disease mutations from creating uh, the gain of function um, um, plasma membrane protrusion phenotype. So in summary, I've shown you um, that tau one is the plasma membrane sculpting kinase. Um, this work has been, um, all of the work I've shown you has been done by Neil, who's a very talented research scientist in my lab. Um, and recently he's been joined by a rotation student, Andres, who is working with um, our collaborator, the lab of Xiao and Ong, uh, to try to map at the molecular level which amino acids might be phosphorylated um, by the kinase domain. We're also collaborating with um, Ning Zhang's lab uh, in trying to solve the structure of um, the, uh, the triple helix. Uh, further, using a human stem cell model, um, uh, we are trying to uh, characterize um, um, the heterozygous human tau one mut mutation and try to test how human stem cell derived neurons are affected by this tau one mutation. Um, and in that, we are helped by Julie Matthew, um, who, uh, um, who is at uh, Ice Cream. And finally, um, we are very interested in trying to identify allosteric uh, small molecule activators of tau one um, in order to test can we trap these disease mutants in an active conformation? or in a conformation where they're unable to bind the plasma membrane. And with that, um, help us um, uh, prevent the aberrant neuronal phenotype. And in that, we are collaborating with the lab of Dustin uh, Maui. So overall, the lessons that we have learned from studying these tau kinases is that kinases can be extremely pleiotropic. So we understand the, uh, and focus quite a bit on the catalytic domain of the kinases, but other domains within kinases um, can uh, impart on them really different um, uh, activities. And then the kinase domain can, can in turn regulate those other domains um, um, uh, to lead to really uh, diverse uh, functions within the cell. Kinase dead disease mutations can be actually gain of function. So even though they are catalytically dead, uh, because of the inherent pleiotropy of the protein, um, you could have disease mutations that are gain of function and not loss of function. And understanding the molecular function of protein kinases is critical for development of future therapeutic um, interventions. Um, and maybe allosteric activators and modulators is, um, is a field uh, that needs to be actively studied in, in the field of neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, so I'm gonna um, end on this slide, um, kind of summarizing what my lab is doing. We are really interested in mapping the neuronal kinome. Um, we are interested in identifying uh, key kinases that are important for neurodevelopment. Um, so uh, there are a few kinases that we are studying in lab that I didn't get the chance to talk about today. Uh, Josie Shade is uh, a graduate student in the lab. She is working um, on another disease associated um, uh, kinase, MILAC1, which is strongly associated with autism. Um, and she's using a chemical genetic approach to map novel substrates um, of this kinase. We're also interested in understanding uh, the synaptic kinome um, and, and mapping the uh, interactions of these substrates of the kinases that we have identified. Um, and some of this work is being uh, done by uh, Bailey Werner and Riley, uh, who, who recently uh, uh, left to join that school. Uh, we are interested in um, understanding the phosphoproteome in disease states, uh, specifically the example I showed today was the 16P11.2 copy number variation. Um, and then the stem cell modeling of disease-associated kinases is a really important field because it allows us to study in a human-relevant context uh, the consequences of these kinase uh, dysfunction. 
And with that, I'd like to thank my lab um, and um, also my, uh, my collaborators uh, at the university and, and beyond. Um, and a special acknowledgement to the Department of Pharmacology and its leadership for giving me uh, an excellent environment to do my research. Um, um, also to the Institute of Stem Cell and uh, Regenerative Medicine, um, at which I'm a core member, um, who have been a really collaborative and innovative environment to work with. Um, and finally, my funding sources. And I'll be very happy to take um, any questions you might have. Oh, hi. What wonderful talk. Thank you, John. Thank you. So, so two things. One, this idea that uh, collapsing each binding pocket is perturbing the pathology could have several consequences, one of which is preventing intramolecular hospitalization of the tiniest of We've certainly seen that in other diseases. Have you looked to see? The overall phosphate incorporation within the tau P1 or tau P2 catalytic core is changed because it cannot phosphorylate itself. We, it, we know they're kind of dead, so they cannot autophosphorylate and they cannot phosphorylate their substrates, but we haven't looked at ATP incorporation because that could be different. Because in, in some of the disease causing mutations that we looked at, there's almost 11 moles of phosphate lost in some of them, and they're not, they're not tiny steps up. And so that could be an explanation of these fairly easy things to test. Sure, sure. And then the second thing, um, can you mimic the tiny dead effect with the general ATP analog tiny steady? We haven't tried that experiment because the to do that, we have to make the gatekeeper mutant and the gatekeeper mutant inactivates it. Yeah, so, so we, yeah, so we have to then do a rescue with secondary mutations. And at that point, we've just perturbed it enough. Um, we have done something similar for tau 2 um, but not in, for identifying substrates, but not in the context of inhibiting uh, the tau 2 activity. That's a great point though. If, we, if that can be done, that would be, that would be cool. Jared? Um, I had a question. So, if I understood you right, the diff one of the main differences between Tau 1 and Tau 2 is if it's by the microtubules versus uh, the plasma membrane, is that right? And that's controlled just by the C terminal. It's, it's also the ER targeting domain. So, the um, maybe I can go back to the, um, to the slide. Um, there is a hydrophobic um, region in. Um, in tau two, that's pretty unique. So this one is not present in tau one. And then the microtubule binding domain is, is right here. Um, and then this sequence is um, dissimilar enough where this is forming a triple helix and this is forming um, a double coil coil overlap. Um, so except for the kinase domain um, and maybe the region linking it to the coil coil, it appears that the C terminal is very, very different. Mm -hmm. And then um, my other question was, so in the uh, 16P11 um, to do uh, copy number variant cell lines, um, have you looked to see if those, once you turn them into neurons, do they have the same spine, uh, spine morphology phenotypes that you've yeah. seen in the knockout or the overexpressive ones? So we've done uh, very little of that, primarily because human neurons grow relatively, really slow. And to get normal dendritic spines in, in control condition is hard, very hard. So we are kind of comparing immature neurons from like maybe control and 16B deletion duplication. And in the deletion, we see more philopodia. So we are kind of comparing philopodia to more philopodia, not necessarily dendritic yeah, spines too. Spine. Yeah, um, but we haven't done more advanced um, organoid cultures, for example, that may allow the neuron to develop really yeah, functional. Yeah, state. yeah. But that's a direction we want to move in. It'll be good to have um, sort of a more mature neuronal version in, in the stem cell model. Uh, Andrea? Uh, so 
against the formation of? The formation of the building. The, yes, so the, so the kinase dead has more membrane extensions than the wild type. Right, so is there any Yeah, so that's that's something that we're really interested in because it appears that, except outside the disease context, there has to be some uh, upstream physiological signal that turns the kinase on and off because you would want the kinase to be inactive when you want to extend membrane, when you want to extend dendrites. Um, we don't know what that is. Um, there is some sort of um, earlier studies on these kinases when none of this was known that show that it's stress activated. Um, very bizarrely, there's a calcium binding pocket in the kinase domain. So calcium could be a signal. We haven't tested that. Um, so for example, calcium influx through NMD receptors uh, could be a signal for activation of it um, or, or inactivation. Um, so we, we are very interested in finding what's upstream. Ben? So I was just going to say in the and CalK1 looks like K3 and the, and the other normal one. So is that charge distribution similar amongst all the other uh, cows? And if so, would you predict that lack of the cow that can be the same? Um, yeah. So that we haven't looked at charge distribution. We have looked at the, um, the prediction of the triple helix, and they are predicted to form triple helix as well. Um, so it's quite likely that they will have the membrane binding domain as well. Um, there haven't been any mutations found in tau 3 um, and we haven't looked at its expression level. So we don't know whether it's highly expressed in the brain, for example. We know that tau 1 and tau 2 could be. So protein expression levels could be tissue specific, for example, um, although um, it appears that they're ubiquitous. Um, there is a little bit of change in the C terminus. So the tau 3 is slightly shorter. And there are precedents of other proteins where just a small change in the C-terminal domain could um, um, lead to cross dimerization and um, degradation of a protein. So for example, tau-1 could cross dimerize with tau-3 and induce its degradation. There, iso there, there are certain proteins that have shown to be uh, doing sort of isoforms, uh, cross isoform dimerization and degradation. So we haven't looked at tau 3 at all, um, just because it didn't show up in any of the disease um, uh, conditions. But uh, we would be very interested to look at. And given its triple, triple helix, I, I think that it's quite likely it'll have the same charge distribution um, and plasma membrane binding capability. Sandy? Hi. Um, there are lots of proteins that bond to the cell. Um, and they bond to the cell. So when you get over association of this with the plasma membrane, do you have any evidence that some of these other invasive species too are disrupted? That's a great question. We we haven't looked at that. The only thing that we have done is use these um, PIP sensors, um, and they they are not they're not really sensing PIP. They're just basically binding them. So if we compete the PIP sensors with tau-1, in certain situations, we see cooperativity. I was expecting that there would be a release of the PIP sensor, uh, but we are seeing like the PIP sensor binds more. So uh, we don't understand that. And I think that a structural perspective in this would be very, very informative. Um, so we, we are very interested in thinking of it from a structural perspective. But there, there are a lot of proteins like bar proteins, for example, they, they have the same triple helix, they dimerize, and they do exactly the same thing to the point that we think that this might be a bar-like domain. That was going to be my next question. Was, was there any homology to bar domain? So yes, structurally, yes. And to show that it's a bar domain, um, the bar domain is defined very loosely. Um, it, at least from my reading appears that it has to be a triple helix. It has to be a dimer. So it is a triple helix. We don't know if it's a dimer. Um, we are going to do those experiments. What if you swap the bar domain to the bar domain? This yeah, we could do a chimera experiment. Um, yeah, I, we, are, we are very uh, interested in mapping what is the kinase domain phosphorylating because that is, it seems like it's an intramolecular um, 
um, regulate auto regulation of its binding. Um, so mapping the upstream, mapping the intramolecular, um, and the dimerization would be um, things to consider. Uh, if not one piece of business, it's this little thing over here. We've got hidden from that I have to get. So um, our little certificate, I always say it's one thing to be invited to speak elsewhere, but uh, when your own colleagues here invite you to speak, that's a big deal. So this is a big deal. It, it has one important use. Okay. okay, and that is you could take it. You should take it with you whenever you go to speak with your chair. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another place where it will, will, will be useless, and that's on your kids. Okay, <laughs> but it does have some. So thanks very much. Thank you.